Hey everybody, welcome to this edition of Bird Brain 66 with your host Brian Bretsch. He's Andy Teague over there on the other side. And uh, this evening we are uh, joined by a, a great special guest, uh, St. Louis Cardinal broadcaster, uh, Mike Claiborne. He's also uh, has a really good uh, online uh, storytelling group out there called Claibs on my uh, Claibs Online. Let me get that straight one more time. I want to give him good props since my tongue got twisted. ClaibsOnline.com got a lot of great uh, sports news out there, so we want everyone to check that out. Hey, Mike, uh, thanks for joining us. Hey, it's a pleasure. Um, you know, when you approached me about it, it, it made me think about my good old days, with especially when it came to trading cards and, and something as we talked before this. You know, I used to use trading cards, the ones I didn't like. I would use them to block the, my cap, my baseball cap as a kid. I don't know if you guys, you may not be that old to remember that, but they used to have, that's how you would block your cap so the logo on your front of your cap would be able to stand out. So we took the baseball cards of guys we didn't, we didn't like, maybe because they were on the Cubs or some other team, and uh, we'd use those, and then they'd be all sweaty at the end of the day. So uh, car collecting is a very unique um, trade and it's a, it's a fun business to be involved in. Well, cool. yeah, today we're going to talk about the 1985 uh, top set, the team that went to the uh, World Series. But uh, before we even go that way, before I let Andy ask one quick question, this is one that we always have fun with Mike, with everybody. So back in the day when you were a youngster and you went to the local five and dime or wherever you went, do you remember who the very first card was, the very first pack of tops that you opened up? Doesn't necessarily have to be a cardinal. Do you remember? Yeah. Who that had to be? Tom Tresh. I remember like it was yesterday. And I and I had to and I remember because I had a Tom Tresh glove. This is one of my first gloves. You know how they had every you know, everybody had a glove back then. And so that was the first person. Right, right, right. And if Tom so Andy, Tresh were to break in on this interview, <laughs> I'd n I wouldn't know him. <laughs> that would make three of us <laughs> he's a good player he played minnesota twins he's a good player but you know he was in the american league and that was the other thing you know i, I lived in a national league city and we never saw uh, american league teams unless it was for the world series okay uh first cardinal card you remember oh man um i want to say dick hughes okay so that's about Maybe, yeah no you know what no it was earlier than that it was earlier than that. Um, man, I have, let me come back to that because I need to think about that. But I remember having a Dick Hughes card. Gotcha. Yeah, that's like 60, 67, 68. 67, in that time. Yeah, that was the year Gibson broke his leg and Dick Hughes took over. Well, Dick Hughes was on that team. He was a journeyman and uh, had a chance to pitch for the Cardinals. It was pretty good. Um, I remember the first pitch he ever threw in the majors. It, it sailed over everybody and hit the back screen, I believe, it was in Philadelphia. And I was like, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so Andy, as we get into the into the nineteen eighty five team, I know Mike's gonna have some great memories, you know, covering that uh for KMOX. Um, tell us a little bit about the the nineteen eighty five World Series and, and why that was special to you based on being in the Air Force and where you were located. Oh, I was actually stationed at uh, Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri at the time. So it was about That's where all the missiles are, right? They used to be. They oh, okay. They left, they left there in 93. I was actually there when they left. So, yeah, actually was at Whiteman, left, and came back to Whiteman before the missiles left. So got to be there twice. So, yeah, it was a great experience. I actually was about an hour away from Royal Stadium from where I was at. So uh, I don't even remember how these guys got these tickets to the world, first game of the World Series, but they knew as a Cardinals fan, they, hey, hey, you'd like to go to the World Series game, game one. It's like, yeah, I, I don't know, because they have a lot of uh, what they call morale, welfare, and recreation programs, and they probably got them from somebody there. A lot of times they'll hand out free tickets to military folks, and so we just headed on up. Uh, uh, I can't even remember. What, highway 50. It was Highway 50. It wasn't on the interstate. We used to drive up Highway 50 to get up uh, to Kansas City. I went up there and uh, got to watch the uh, first game of the World Series, and uh, Got to watch Tudor, you know, pitch a nice game. That, it wasn't as nice as his second game he pitched, but uh, that was a memory I had from being able to be at the first game. My and, memory and Mike, would, for you. My memory would be game six. <laughs> I know well, yeah. for as long as I live. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I remember doing a post-game show, and it was Bob Gibson, myself, and another guy, Bob Mayhall. And as soon as the game was over with, Bob Mayhall said, I'll get the gun if you have the bullets. 
you know, I'll never forget that as long as I live. And uh, it, it was a great series, though. I mean, you know, it yeah. was the, you know, both teams were really good. Both teams had really good pitching. Uh, Cardinals were a little short, obviously, without Vince Coleman. But uh, overall, it was a well played series, and uh, the best team didn't win. But you know what? It, I think it was good for 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 baseball uh, because Kansas City had had a starting point. And uh, that was one of those situations where they had something to rally around. And they've been reasonably competitive. They won another World Series over the Mets. But it, it, it really put them on the map because they had a great player in George Brett. And, and he was a guy that they, I thought had been overlooked because he was in the Midwest and people didn't see him a lot. And if you recall, he was a guy that flirted with 400 for a while. So yeah. he was a great player. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a tough series to lose. But it was fun because, you know, we were right down the road from each other. Right. Yeah, the uh, I-70 Show Me Series, second time that the uh, World Series was all Missouri. Had to go back to 44 with the Browns and the, and the Cardinals uh, for, the, for the first one. But uh, I, I, love the, I love the series. I was already a sports reporter back then, so unfortunately I didn't attend any of the, uh, of, of the games in person. I was the snot-nosed guy, the new guy to the sports desk at the News Democrat, so I got the man, you know, the phones, and if anybody was having problems sending their stories, I was the one that had to uh, – had to take dictation, but, uh, you'd mentioned, you'd mentioned, uh, you know, Vince going down with the, with the tarp and, and such from, from that, uh, uh, 85 team, Mike, I'll ask you the, this question and then I'll turn it over to Andy with the same question. Who, who really stuck out to you or who were some of your favorites, uh, on the team back then? Oh man. You know what? That, it was such a team that if, if you called out a name, I could give you a reason why the Cardinals were that good that year. Ozzy was a guy. Uh, Terry Pendleton hit the big home run against the Mets in New York off of Roger McDowell. I mean, there were so many different guys who had moments in, the, in that particular year. And I, I guess if you had a guy who had a great moment, it was Ozzy Smith, who should have won the Most Valuable Player Award that year. Uh, mm -hmm. They had multiple guys. I think they stole like 330 bases that year. I mean, Andy Van Slyke had 39 stolen bases. I mean, they were a juggernaut. And they could beat you in a lot of different ways. Um, you had Ozzy, you had Pendleton, you had Tom Hur, who had an incredible season, over 100 RBIs uh, with what 11 home runs. I mean, it was an incredible season for him. But you know, th there were so many guys that contributed. You know, when you look back at championship teams, championship teams have have a guy that comes up big when you least expect it. So when you look at the roster, all 25. Uh, make a contribution. And that team really was the epitome of, of guys stepping up when people were hurt and guys stepping up when you least expected it. Andy, for you, what about who are, who are some of the guys that stood out uh, for you? And if you have their cards, Andy, go ahead and throw them up. Oh, well, you know what? Let, 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 I mean, one other guy while I'm thinking about, it, cause I, I'll forget about Jack Clark. And here's why. Oh, absolutely. Well, two things, Jack Clark, because w then you could be on the field for batting practice and he has such a distinct sound. And I've only heard, ever heard it one other time, and that, that was when Mark McGuire would hit a home run. Jack Clark's the, – the ball coming off his bat in batting practice is something you were just like, whoa. And the Cardinals infield, they don't do it anymore, but in the 80s, they, they took infield every day, and they let the fans in the ballpark. So when you think about Pendleton and Ozzie and her and Clark, it was like watching the Harlem Globetrotters. I mean, they didn't drop a ball. They didn't miss anything. And people, and you guys are old enough to remember when McGuire would take BP, how people would show up oh, early yeah. and be in awe. Well, that was the way it was for the Cardinals in, in 1985 when they took infield. Very cool. Andy, what about you? Well, I had Tudor up there, obviously, because, you know, oh, yeah. came over and he was just – He's a phenomenal form, and one of my one of my favorites during that time period. Obviously, Willie. I just always loved Willie, and then uh, I always want to give uh, credit to the art. I said calling the architect of the '80s because you know he really brought uh, respectable baseball back to St. Louis when he came over. And uh, Mike, you mentioned uh, George Brett earlier. I was always hopeful that he was somehow going to swing some kind of deal to bring Brett over to St. Louis. <laughs> Once he got to the Cardinals, but it did, unfortunately never worked out that way. But always hopeful that uh, Brett would actually make it on our roster at some point. You, you know, you weren't the only one. There were a lot of people who used to have that whisper campaign going because of Whitey's connections in Kansas City. 
Uh, Whitey taught everybody over in Kansas City baseball. He taught them not to be stupid either as far as trading right. a guy like George right. Brett. <laughs> right, right, right. Hey, Mike, so um, one of the unique things that Andy and I talked about before we, we before you joined us was uh, how, how I mean, I'm talking about what, what Andy was just talking about, Whitey Herzog, and just what he was able to do with, with baseball. How unique was he back in, in the 80s, even going back to 82, when, um, you know, especially with the relief guys, all of a sudden he'd need to bring in, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think of who, who would be coming out of the bullpen, like Todd Worrell in, in 87 or, or uh, Ken Daly. How unique was it for him to, you know, when he had a righty lefty road yeah. uh, coming up where he would take the pitcher and stick him in the outfield for yeah, one he, batter? He would, he would stick Worrell out there at times. You know, Whitey Herzog was so far ahead of everyone. Um, I remember the Mets playing the Cardinals that year, and a writer wrote, Whitey Herzog was so good against Davey Johnson. He said that by the time this is over with, Whitey Herzog would go through Dave Johnson's bench and he'd have to use everybody. And the only guy he'd have le left would be Wally Backman or Kelvin Chapman, one of the two. Right. And lo and behold, there was a game like that. Uh, he, he just had great vision and he, he was a great communicator with his players. I mean, he didn't have to come up and buddy up with you every day, but he kind of let you know, hey, this is what you ought to be thinking about. I'm going to have you in this situation if we get there. Uh, we talk about analytics a lot today in the game. Whitey was analytics before anybody could, knew what a lot laptop was. I mean, mm -hmm. he had it all. He had an incredible memory. He didn't forget anything. And he had a spray chart that we see now that everybody uses. He used to use colored pencils for, for each player. And, and he was so far ahead of the pack, but he, it was his team. And Whitey knew how to manage good players. And he let them play, but he reminded them that, you know, the, we only have two rules here, be on time and play like hell when I ask you to. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, he was a pretty simple guy, but he really understood people and the game and put guys in right situations. Good managers always find a way to put their, good, their best players or any of their players in situations where they can succeed. Yeah. And Andy, as a fan, you know, you're, you're in Kansas City, you're a, you're a Cardinal fan at the time. Uh, leading up to that, how as a fan, did that drive you crazy? Or did you think that was a stroke of genius? Or did that never even really occur to you when he was moving up, you know, like a flipping daily and, and uh, Worrell and, you know, in the outfield just to face that righty lefty matchup? I, I mean, I, th I, did, I think I thought it was genius because, you know, nobody had ever done anything like that before. And I think a lot of people thought he was crazy for what he was doing. But I think it helped make those teams that he managed successful by the way he handled it you know, manage the teams and the, and the way he handled that pitching staff too. He did a great job. And I, and I remember one time, I can't remember if that was that year or uh, another year, but I remember him taking uh, Tudor out when he was pitching a no hitter. I don't know if you guys remember that particular game. I do. I think the fans are going to come unglued about that, but you know, he knew what he was doing and you know, he did it for the, you know, the, the betterment of the team. And I think people today wouldn't think anything of that because if you, you can see guys now, you know, only pitch maybe five, six innings a, a lot, a lot of times now, but back then, we, you know, we had more complete games in, in, in baseball and even further back, you know, when Gibson, those guys are playing, I told Brian the other day, I was looking in the back of a Bob Gibson card. And he had 28 complete, 28 games. complete games. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, that's, that's more than a national league will have this year. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And nine, nine straight years of 200 strikeouts, you know, that was that was phenomenal too. So I'm gonna ask both of you guys this question. So I'm holding up uh, Lonnie Smith's card from 1985. So just uh, one of the things that I forgot about it was a great. Uh, was he on that team? Well, no, he was not. He yeah, got right. traded midway through the season. That's right. Yeah. Royals. Right. Exactly. The Royals uh, for John because, Morris. And uh, yeah, that's what I was about to say. I, I made one mistake earlier. I mentioned Ozzy being the MVP candidate. That was 87. Willie McGee won the MVP right. in 1985. Yeah. So yeah. I want to yeah, clear that up before, okay. before I discredit this, this program. And people say, what do you have that <laughs> nut on for? He didn't even know what McGee did. So I want to clear that up. <laughs> no, that, that's okay. No, the reason why I was bringing that up, because I was always a, a skates fan, Lonnie fan, and yeah. And uh, yeah. like, was he on that team? And then the more I got to thinking about it, no, he wasn't. Yeah. To, and then Andy, well, you were telling me was he was what the first guy to be traded midseason with, and 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 go to the team he played against in the World Series? Yeah, yeah. Lonnie was a good player. Um, they called him Skates because he was really clumsy. 
He had real small feet for an athlete, and uh, he, he was really clumsy. Strong as an ox, could really run. Uh, he was a defensive question mark in the outfield. Uh, and, and one of the things that kind of took him down, he had some off-field issues that really slowed him down and really got him out of the game. But he was a good hard-nosed player. Uh, you did not want to be at second base hanging around the bag on a double play ball because he would clean you out. You, you find yourself yeah. in left field. Uh, but he did the Cardinals a great service in 82. Obviously, yeah. he was a very helpful player for the Royals in 85. Yeah, and then you mentioned uh, – one thing you mentioned earlier, Mike, too, is about the Mets. And I, a lot of people, depending on, you know, how old they are and what they remember about the, uh, the National League, you know, the Cardinals actually used to be in the East, you know, especially during this time frame. So that was one of the big rivals, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. You know, we, we talk about the Cardinal-Cub rivalry. Uh, th- that Cardinal-Met rivalry was really vicious. Yes. Um, Danny Cox, George Foster, I remember that. Uh, they, and Whitey thought Howard Johnson had a loaded bat. Uh, and they x-rayed the yeah. bat. Uh, yeah. I mean, there were so many head games that were going on. And, and Dave Johnson, who was a good manager, but, you know, he, he met his match against – uh, the Mets had that great pitching staff. They had Gooden. They had Ron Darling. Sid Fernandez, big chunky yep. left-hander from Hawaii. Yeah. Who else did they have? They had another good pitcher on their team. Wasn't that was it eighty five or did he come up late eighty four? I think Gooden wasn't that his rookie. Yeah, year Gooden. Yeah, it was Gooden. Yeah, Gooden. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, he was dealing. Uh, so they had really good pitching. Strawberry was on the team. Uh, yep. They weren't as good defensively, obviously, as the Cardinals. Keith Hernandez was on the team. Yep. Uh, they had some star power. And if you recall that following year in 86, they ran away and hid with the, the remember Whitey said, this thing will be over with by Mother's Day. Mm-hmm. I mean, so uh, it was a real spirited rival rivalry. Uh, the New York media really liked to get in the Cardinals kitchen. You know, we had some pretty civil writers here in St. Louis uh, with Rick Hummel leading the way. But yeah, it got a little testy from time to time. And I think the one that I remember most is Danny Cox and George Foster. You know, Foster took his time getting in the batter's box and Danny Cox would step off and then Foster would step out. And this went on for a while. And then Danny Cox drilled him. I mm-hmm. mean, just, just, I mean, just plunked him. And you're saying, he saying George Foster at that time might've been one of the strongest guys in the game. And, and Danny Cox certainly was in that category too. And I'm saying to myself, this is, this, this could be a, a real ruckus that the only way it stops is if they get tired because nobody yeah, could exactly. break those two up. And then you had Strawberry, who was looking for action at that point. So, yeah, it was a pretty spirited rivalry. Yeah, you needed a couple of uh, NHL linemen, or yeah. linemen to come in and break <laughs> yeah. it up. I don't even and, think they would have broke it up. And, and Terry Pendleton was, was a guy that never turned out an invitation either. So right. there were enough guys on each side of the fence that if, if you want to go there, we'd be more than happy to accommodate you. Right. So and I'm going to bring up another guy, too. So this is uh, John Tudor oh. here. John too. Great lefty for us. But another one that, that kind of surprised me, uh, just doing some research as I set the card off, off the camera here for just a second. Do you guys, and I'm, and I'm not putting you on the spot because I had to look it up. Do you remember who we traded to acquire him? George Hendrick. Yes, oh, that's right. right. Yes. Yeah, George Hendrick. Uh, so you know the story about Tudor. Tudor was like one and seven in his first, first part of the season. And his high school catcher happened to see him on a game and uh, realized he had a little mechanical flaw. Gave mm-hmm. him a call, and, and the rest was history. He, I mean, Tudor was de- – he had that kind of stuff, and he was a guy that always complained about how his bullpen was crappy and he didn't feel good. I don't know if I can get through the fifth inning tonight. And the next thing you know, you look up, and he's got three – he's given up three hits. He's punched out nine yeah. or 12 people. Uh, but he was tough. He was, he was not scared, and he believed in his stuff. And, and he, was, he was tough on the media. Oh, man. He, he – he had no patience for bad questions. <laughs> and I remember one year he just said, you know, I guess apparently all you need to do is have a driver's license to be a writer because it doesn't seem like you guys know much more about anything else. I mean, he was tough. And now and there, he was, was kind of grumpy. He's mm-hmm. mellowed a little bit now, but not much. If he knows you, he's fine. If he doesn't know you, then he's very standoffish. But he kind of took that, that pitching staff by the horns because we already had Joaquin Andohar. Who had a really good season that year, mm-hmm. and uh, he and Andahar were as good of a one-two punch. And here comes young Danny Cox, who was giving the Cardinals some quality innings. You had Bob Forsh. I mean, they had a pretty good rotation. Yeah. 
And one of the guys that I always said gets lost in, in the shuffle, and he was always a favorite of mine. And Mike, you may know the answer in this because Andy and I talked about it right before you joined us. I'm holding up a card of uh, Kurt Kepshire. Yeah. I always thought that he had a promising career. In your recollection, did, did he just come down with some sort of an arm injury? Yeah, I believe so. Um, he had some arm injuries, and it really slowed him down. And you make a great point, Brian. He did have a lot of promise. Uh, he was a feisty guy, had a good fastball to move for him. But I can't remember, was it, was it a shoulder? I don't believe it was Tommy John because Tommy John had, was unheard of at that time. Right. But he kind of came and went. And the Cardinals had a few guys that were in the bullpen that kind of came and went. They had a guy named Jeff Keener who was a submariner, I believe, on that team also, who kind of gave them a different look. And if you recall, that was a bullpen by committee because they didn't have Bruce Suter at that time. So they had to go out and find some guys. They called up a young guy named Todd Worrell. And uh, Ken Daly was a flamethrower from the left side. So they had a pretty interesting bullpen at that time. Definitely. So another answer. guy. Go ahead, Andy. Well, I didn't want to forget about uh, one guy that kind of caught fire, too, in, this, in the series after, after he got hurt. Terrence. Terrence Tito yes. Landrum. Yes. Who's, who was uh, the, the chain sports here for a second, whose son-in-law is future Hall of Famer Paul Pierce. I did not uh, know Formerly of the Boston wow. Celtics. So Tito was a guy who had been in the organization a little bit and uh, could play all the outfield positions. He was a very popular guy on the team. He was that guy that came to the ballpark with a smile every day. And lo and behold, this guy was a bad call away from probably being the World Series MVP. If if the Cardinals win the World Series, Tito Landrum's your MVP. Mm -hmm. But he did so many things well, good pinch hitter, uh, he he ate up left-handed pitching and, and really did a good job against some good righties as well. But w- but the thing was, I think Whitey said, I don't want to overexpose him. You know, you know, everybody wants to be an everyday guy, but a lot of guys aren't everyday guys. And Whitey found opportunities for him. So Tito got to start maybe twice a week. You probably saw him on Thursdays and Sundays. Yeah. 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 So when one to definitely mention him. There's another good guy from the 85. Yeah, D. Braun, oh, pinch hitter extraordinaire. Yes. Uh, if you recall in the 82 World Series, he had that big pinch hit against uh, Bob McClure where he walked him. He, he, he created a walk. It really broke the game open in game six, I believe, or game seven. Uh, Steve Braun was a professional hitter. Uh, didn't play in the field very much, but if Whitey needed a hit or he needed to get a guy to get on base, it was Steve Braun. Uh, really, really disciplined hitter. Yeah, and uh, and he could steal a base. Yeah, you know why he stole bases because nobody thought he was going to. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. You know, he, I mean, he was a very smart player. I mean, he really understood yeah. the game. But he was a guy that would kind of have like a little walking lead, and the next mm-hmm. thing you look over and there, he's not going anywhere. And the next thing you know, he's standing at second base. Yep. So, Mike, one other question, and Andy and I again talked about this. Um, before you joined us been just kind of curious for your insight on it. Obviously we know what happened with Vince with, with the, with the, with the tarp and stuff. Was it Casey's pitching again, led by Sabre Hagen? I think Mark Gubaza was probably a part of that mm-hmm. part of that uh, Royal starting rotation. But I recall they, they like out of the seven games, they only scored like 13, 14, 15 runs. You can't win a world series. I know what yeah. happened in game six, but what do you recall? What was well, it the yeah, they ran across some good pitching. Um, and, and if you recall, you know, because we we never saw Kansas City in the season, we didn't even train in the same areas in spring training. So you're relying solely on scouting reports. And I'll go back to '82, where the Cardinals played the Milwaukee Brewers, and they had a scouting report that was all wrong. Ozzy tore it up and said, "I'm never reading another scouting report again." Um, and I think that's what happened to the Cardinals as well. We, we just didn't know enough about those guys. I mean, you need to have eyes on players. And remember, there was no video where guys could mm-hmm. see what he was throwing. And I, and I think that was part of the problem. But, but let's not take anything away from that Royals pitching staff. They were really good. I mean, they, mm-hmm. they had a good bullpen. Um, and, you know, Saberhagen was like, I wouldn't call him a phenom, but he was certainly the flavor of the month. and had a really good career. Uh, and they had some other veterans on that team as well. So, yeah, I, I think the pitching, as we know, good pitching always stops good hitting, and I think their pitching certainly was superior. Yeah. They had, what was it, uh, 
Quiz in the uh, Quisenberry in the uh, Dan, Dan, Dan the, Quisenberry in the bullpen. And you remember he was a, a submariner, right? And there just weren't that many guys out there that you could square up like that. And if you didn't see him, then you were going to have a problem. And you know they didn't really use him that much in the World Series. Remember with uh, with them having the DH. Uh, you know, they, they'd leave a pitcher in there for a while. You didn't have to pinch hit for them, especially when they were at home. And, they, and obviously they were really good at home. Right. Well, speaking of DH, I just, uh, just, I forgot about this until I read about this earlier this week. The, uh, this was the last time that the American, or they actually had hitters in American league ballparks that were, you know, the pitchers were hitting in the American league ballpark during the series because it used to flip flop every year. Right. Right. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. The, on the odd years, it would be, it would, they would, the pitchers would hit in the world series and the even years they would not, they would use the DH. Yeah. This DH thing has been a thorn in the national league side yeah. for years. <laughs> and, and I think after this year, we'll see the DH in both leagues, but yeah, it was a little bit of an adventure for some pitchers. Uh, and you know, it, it's funny that the world series is decided on eight batters, not nine, because we always always assume that the, uh, the batter in the American league, the pitcher wasn't going to be effective and it lived up to that expectation. Yeah. So as we uh, get ready to wrap uh, again, Andy, I'll, I'll throw this out to you first. Okay. Uh, lasting memories. And, and I mean, outside of <laughs> we could do like, 14 hours and still never get to the oh, end yeah. of the story on, on game, on game six. But what are some of your other uh, memories of, of that I 70 series? Well, I, first of all, I blank, I blank out game six. And, <laughs> and, and I, and I know George Brett did an interview several years ago. It said Cardinal fans need to get, get over it. No, George, we can never get over that. No, George, we're all, you know what? Right. When we go to the grave, we'll have two holes. We'll take to the grave with us. We'll have the we'll, game six. We'll take to the grave with us. That's for, for, for game six. We'll have a hole for game six and then we'll have a hole for ourselves. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we're, we're never going to forget it. Uh, well, even when I'm in Kansas city now, I, I still kind of bristle when people bring that up. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You got hair stands up on the back of your neck. When yeah. You, yeah. And, and you know, what's, what's funny about that game is that there were two plays. Daryl Porter didn't catch that foul ball. And I thought Andy Vance like threw a rocket. I thought the guy, I thought he was out at the plate uh, and how the game ended. I mean, mm-hmm. that was as good of a throw as you're going to see from yeah. an outfielder. And the way Daryl Porter showed his displeasure with that call, I always felt he was out. But, you know, the Cardinals had their chances in that game. So when I look back, it, maybe it was just fate because they had their chances uh, in that game. But game seven, we knew it was a wrap. Uh, there was no way we were going to beat them. So, um, But I always felt that it was just – it was one of those twists of fate that, that, it, that it happened in the manner that it did. But it's, it's still a bitter pill to swallow. But I, and going back to your question too, Brian, I think – as far as the series is concerned, I, I, I'll actually go back to the series before that with the Dodgers because, though, to me, there are two memorable home runs in that series. Obviously, the go crazy folks, you know, with uh, Jack Buck, you know, with Ozzy hitting that home run, and then also uh, with uh, Jack Clark. I mean that, and the, and Vin, and we talked about that before. Vin Scully, you know, talking about you know T- Tommy Lasorda in the dugout trying to make a decision whether or not to walk uh, Jack Clark, and then. Uh, yeah, I think Vince Scully said that blankety blank. Yeah, yeah, blankety. He, yeah, he said pitch to the SOB. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? In, in one sense, you think back because remember, Needon Fuhrer struck out Clark yeah. earlier and made him look yeah. bad. Um, but you know what, man? It, it's hard to get a guy twice in that short a period of time. And, you know, Needon Fuhrer had had a few innings on his arm. You have to remember, he, was, he pitched in, you know, virtually every game in that series. He just didn't have anything left. And uh, Jack Clark hit one. I'll never forget Pedro Guerrero, like a little leaguer, when that ball sailed over his head, just threw his glove down in disgust. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But that was, I, you know what, to be honest with you, not because of the outcome, but because of the play. I thought, I thought that series was better than the World Series. It had Absolutely. a lot of action to it. Absolutely. No, I, I, I forgot about the Pedro Guerrero thing until you just said that, where he just. Turns yep. around and yeah, that, was, that was. I know I did it when I was a little leaguer when somebody oh, yeah. would mess up. Oh, and... absolutely, absolutely. Just you know, I'm I'm done. Game's over. I'm yeah. going home. I just no ice cream tonight. 
But unfortunately, we still had to go get the ball in Little League. Yeah, that's right. There was no fence. Yeah, <laughs> just keep running for it. You're absolutely yeah, you had, right. You had two baseballs. That was it. So if someone hit it over the fence, somebody on the bench had to get it. Yeah. Well, well Mike, uh, we're going to get ready to wrap up. We want to be mindful of, of your time. Greatly appreciate uh, you joining uh, Andy on Andy and us on uh, Bird Brain 66. So um, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that uh, I give, uh, you know, props to your Klaibs online. Love uh, the work that you and Joe and, and your other new guests are having on there. I know you got your your golf stuff with uh, Jay Randolph Jr. You got some good hockey talk out there. I'm on it. I'm watching a lot of the, the videos myself. So I know you do your Tuesday uh, cup of, and that's not cup of Joe. Lunch with Joe. We do it Lunch. on Mondays, but this week we'll do it on Tuesday. Uh, one thing I would suggest people check out is uh, the, the, the daily card with Joe Roderick and Bob Ramsey and also Keith Costas, who's the chief researcher for the MLB network. He and Bob Ramsey do a segment every week as well. So if you really want to dig deep into the game, that, that's something that we were getting a really good response from people getting a kick out of uh, young Keith, Bob's son, who's doing a phenomenal job and, and Rammer, Mr. Lineup himself, who lives and breathes writing up lineup cards. Uh, so it, it's a lot of fun for those guys and uh, we're getting a good response from it. So I appreciate you bringing it up. Yep. So uh, again, we'll wrap up here. I'm uh, Brian Brett, your host, co-host, Andy Teague, this is BirdBrain66. You can check us out on Twitter at our handle at BirdBrain66, on Facebook at BirdBrain66, as well as our new uh, YouTube uh, channel. It's also BirdBrain66. I know we're original. It's BirdBrain66. <laughs> and Michael, again, my friend, I greatly appreciate your time. I know you're, you're busy with the Cardinal broadcast, so thanks for joining us. Hey, yeah, thank you know you. what? No, I, it was my pleasure. And let's pick another Cardinal year out. I'd love to do this again. All right. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, we'll yeah, do we another love, one, man. We've got the cards. I, I just promise you I won't do like 1934 while I have all these. <laughs> no, cards. well, you're on your own on that show. I'll have the flu <laughs> that day. So you're on your own. But, yeah, let's do this again. All right. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right. You, you guys take Thanks. care. Yep. All right.